Hey guys, this is a teardown of a MAP spectrum analyzer. This is a uh, X-ray fluorescence spectrometer which was initially designed for detecting le uh, leaded paint on, uh, on painted surfaces. Basically the idea is you would push this up onto your surface, it would emit uh, X-rays onto it and look at the reflected X-rays in the uh, uh, spectrum of uh, in power or uh, energy of those to determine what the surface uh, had in it, in this case leaded paint. and it was apparently also used later on for detection of toxic heavy metals in soil. When I was looking at this, I was initially wondering how they would fit an x-ray tube into this thing given how small it is, and then I realized this actually has a radioisotope gamma ray source in it, uh, not an x-ray tube. So that's why this is taking so long to tear this down. I got this thing well over a year ago, but I'm not comfortable tearing this down until I got access to a Geiger counter, because yeah, this thing can have uh, from the documentation I read, it can have three different uh, radioisotope sources, uh, cobalt-57, americium-241, and uh, cadmium-109. And uh, the cobalt-57 apparently was the most common. That does 122 kiloelectron volt gamma rays. The, uh, the americium, I think, was 60 or so, and the uh, cobalt is about 200, so they have some different uh, sort of spectrum options for the source. The half-lives of those isotopes vary from, uh, I think it was about 270 days for the cobalt and about 400 days for the other, uh, the other ones. And there's also, there's not a small amount in this. Apparently, from the documentation, this has uh, 40 millicuries in it, which is 40,000 times the amount in a modern smoke detector. So this unit consists of, obviously, the uh, detector head as well as this uh, uh, module that it plugs into that gives you a display. Uh, it comes with... Oh, hey, Trixie comes with a power supply, good old conventional, if I can pull this out of here, 60 hertz transformer, and on the other side there's just a very, very expensive cable with very nice uh, circular connectors on the ends. Let's connect this up and see what it does when we power it up. I'm almost certain the source is completely dead after all this time, given the short half-life, but it's worth seeing if it does anything. So here's this. And this goes in here. And AC. So that's probably the power switch there, so let's see what this does. Scientific Materials, no, SciTech Materials, Metals Analysis Probe, Memory Loss, Clear Memory or Print. Mem, mem Clear. Printer Disconnected. So the print, you can connect a printer to this thing somewhere. I'm actually wondering where that is. That's probably somewhere on the inside of this fabric case thing. How do we... How do we activate this? Do we just push it down? Nope. I suspect this this thing here will open the source. There's another keyed enable thing here that's on the I believe it's on the off position right now, so the source shouldn't be exposed. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's much point trying to get this running. It's almost certainly not going to do anything. Knit. Select primary element to assay. What is that? K gen, L gen, K iron. One. Enter. No. Yeah, I'm expecting this is not going to do anything. Let's just get right to the teardown. So let's see if we can test if the source is. Uh, in this thing. So just pushing the uh, the ground contact probe doesn't seem to change anything. We're still just getting background. I figured this lock is actually pretty easy to defeat just by turning it around. And even that, when I push the probe, we don't hear anything beyond just the background on this. So I'm suspecting the source is either completely dead or has been removed. Just, just There's some screws missing, so I suspect whoever has been in here may have removed it. Also, there's a label been removed here that it was probably some sort of radiation warning label. This came from some sort of uh, e-waste facility, so I'm suspecting they may have uh, safed this, or made it safe before uh, disposing of it. Oh. 
Okay, let's see what's in this thing. If we can get this open. So, what do we see in here? It's a bit hard to see. Let me put the camera around a bit. But we definitely have some sort of a chain thing. So this, uh... There we go. So yeah, so far the detector is detecting nothing, so that's good. Yeah, it seems like when you turn this, so interesting. Yeah, when you turn this, it turns this chain, which that must turn the source from the safe side to the active side. And then this thing, aha, that exposes the, uh, exposes it. So I put that back to the armed side. Yeah, you can see in there, I don't see anything in the source compartment. And definitely nothing is coming up on the Geiger counter when I open that. So this seems to be safe. So here's a much better view of how this works. Yeah, this just pushes this large steel or lead shield out from in front of the source, and there's definitely, there is no source remaining in there. So someone has been in here and has removed it. This was all sealed with silic, this thing was all sealed with silicone. And there's a very thin, probably aluminum plate for the x-rays to go in and out of. And then around the outside, there you have more silicone that has been, been removed. And let's see, this must be the x-ray sensor here. There's some copper shielding in between it and the source. Just look at that. The, so yeah, the source, the source looks like it, based on the positioning of this uh, piece of metal here, would expose sort of at an angle, then it would ref capture the Results uh, again at an angle from this, uh, and the, that must be the, uh, the detector. The back of this thing is held on quite tightly with some uh, sealant or uh, ga uh, gasket, uh, sort of an O-ring. See if we can try and figure out how to get the inside section of this out. Come on. Yeah, this is really that O-ring is really holding it in tightly. There we go. There. Okay. Oh yeah, that's all machined. This has a decent length on it. And there's that gasket, so it's sort of like a molded rubber piece. And then inside here, we have, I see a bit of electronics. I see some TO220s, there's a board. Still no clues how to get this out though. Although this enclosure does appear to be extruded aluminum. Okay, this thing is finally free now. I just had to remove a whole bunch of screws, had to remove a little uh, plate that went in here, and now the uh, internal circuitry seems to pull out. There we go. Interesting, so a whole bunch of boards. Oh wow, look at this metal can, metal lid ceramic IC, look at that. Huh. So there's one, two, Three, four boards in this. Uh, here's the sensor. This must be some sort of a vacuum package. They've cut the yeah, they cut the front off of it for some reason. I guess to let the uh, X-rays through better. Uh, yeah, let's go look, go uh, take a look through these uh, boards. So here's the X-ray detector outside of its little shoulder shell thing, which looks very very homemade. Uh, from what I can tell, this is a silicon pin photodiode inside a uh, container with a beryllium window. Uh, some other uh, x-ray sensors I looked up uh, say they have beryllium windows, so this, and this looks the right color, so I'm not going to go and break that because it could be quite uh, dangerous to breathe in anything from it. But judging by the slight, uh, it's a very slight curvature, so I have a suspicion it may be under vacuum. Uh, there's not much on the back, it says MSL 1214-4, 510 micrometer. That might be the size of the detector, potentially, and 11. Uh, yeah, there's this the copper shield is behind it to pr protect it from x-rays coming directly from the source. Uh, I'm probably going to keep this, might be usable for something, for any some sort of uh, uh, x-ray detection. This first board seems to be uh, an amplifier for the photodiode, or I guess you wouldn't really call it photodiode, just a, the uh, x-ray sensor diode. Uh, this seems to have, this seems to be the input from the power supply which provides a bias, a reverse bias for the diode. That goes through an RC 
two-stage RC filter, and then it's supplied to the uh, photodiode to, <clears throat> to the uh, would be the cathode, probably the cathode of the photodiode is a positive voltage. Then the uh, anode comes out to here. This node, there's a 100 meg resistor that would go down to ground and then a, a FET that would buffer that ultra high impedance output because this, uh, the diode has to detect single photons and the, uh, basically the current impulse that will flow through the diode in reverse bias is proportional to the X-ray intensity. So the the way this works is it sends out known energy x-rays onto the target and when it bounces off, depending on the material, you get different spectrums, or different intensities of x-rays or wavelength of x-rays bounce back. And depending on the wavelength, you get different uh, uh, current pulses, which will then be uh, converted to a voltage by the resistor and then the FET buffers them. Uh, elsewhere on this board, there's a bunch of analog stuff, probably transistors, caps, a lot of... Uh, 20 volt, uh, 68, 6.8 microfarad tantalums. Uh, beyond this, there's a couple of uh, 80, 847, 50 megahertz op amps, and there's some other LM3080, probably comparator op amp, and that would generate, I believe, a pul a uh, analog pulse output that would go off to one of the other boards. This other board in the end looks to be a power supply of some sort. There's a plus and minus 12 volt regulator. Uh, some connections down to another board on the side. It also seems to be power supply, but yeah, this seems to probably would generate a very stable voltage or uh, adjustable reference voltage for the for the uh, photodiode. Ooh, and that chip in the center is a good old 555 timer. On this side, this appears to be some sort of switching power supply. There's these transformers which connect with connections going into this chip, which just seems a bit odd that it's driving them directly. Uh, it's possible they're uh, pulse transformers of some sort. But this, yeah, all of the connections out of this go through this uh, thing. Actually, come to think of it, given that these transformers are uh, connected up near the cable, I think these are probably some sort of an isolated uh, data communications thing. Because the, yeah, that may, explains why they're going on directly onto this chip. Uh, and there's just some other some discrete transistors, some diodes, caps, and a bunch of uh, uh, so 4,000 and uh, 7,400 uh, logic. Yeah, so this is likely the uh, data communication board, probably sending something like serial or some other... Given they're going over transformers, it's going to be some sort of DC balanced uh, encoding. But yeah, this is this is this has got to be a, D a uh, data transmission. Actually, this may this is sort of like power over Ethernet. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so there's. Yeah, there's only four wires going out this, you know, there's five wires, probably ground plus uh, two data lines. But yeah, these seem appear to be coupling transformers because there's uh, the two lines, I believe, go under here to these two on each one. And then there's a common center tap coming out that goes off to the power supply board. So yeah, they're doing some sort of like a power over, power over data line thing here. That's interesting. I mean, they had plenty of pins. They didn't have to do that. There was no reason to do that. So... Wondering uh, why they did it that way. They could easily have taken power over these pins straight to the straight to this. And over here, yeah, this has a bunch of connections that are sort of just soldered through onto the other side of this. So, given they're doing data communications, it's possible. It is possible they're sending analog information uh, over these lines encoded in some sort of like a AM or FM or something. So that is a possibility. All that magic is probably done in this chip here. I'm going to go see if I can find any information on what this is, although I don't have much hope on that. As expected, I couldn't find any information on this, other than one AliExpress listing for someone selling ten of them. And apparently that's sold, so there was some interest. Uh, other than that, yeah, there's not much on this board. There's some analog devices chip. I can't tell which one because of that resistor. Uh, there's uh, another an 87... 711, which is a, uh, a JFED input op amp. There's another op amp and metal can here, and then uh, some 7400 logic. Yeah, so all the magic's going on in this chip. I'm going to see if I can uh, pull the uh, pull the cover off this because I'm curious as to what's in here.
so there is the inside of that chip. It is definitely a hybrid. It's got some sort of uh, die there, and then these little sub modules, the sort of brownish ones that it look like to be uh, laser trimmed resistor modules, sort of a whole nother level of the, the, the large white portion here has some laser trimmed resistors on the side. Then there's these little sub modules that are probably on ceramic boards as well that are also laser trimmed. And of course, there's also a few small dies that are probably op amps or diodes. So this seems to be something digital because there's these tra all these traces on the right that looks like a digital bus. And on the left, it all appears to be analog stuff. So let's take a closer look at these. Uh, the best microscope thing I've got right now is actually the Kronos camera with a uh, microscope lens on it. So let's give that a try. So here's a view of the large die on the right. This seems to generally have digital logic on the right side and then perhaps some sort of analog stuff on the left. It's a little bit hard to get good focus with this setup, but I think this is working pretty well. Let's see if we can zoom in, get a better look at this. Just give you an idea of scale. This is image is about two millimeters wide in total. Yes, there's a image, there's the digital portion. And there's the, uh, I'm guessing it's some sort of analog or IO buffer portion. There we go. Yeah, I don't see any real markings on this, maybe there. Mm, something can't, can't quite zoom, doesn't quite zoom in enough to read it, unfortunately. Here's an overview of that uh, small part with all the trimmed resistors on it. There's a lot of trimmed resistors, like probably 30 or 40 of them on this. You can imagine this might be some sort of an R2R DAC or some sort of a DAC because this I do believe may send analog information over those cable, those lines. There's, there's digital on this side and then appears to be more analog stuff here. So if we zoom in, let's see, turn up the exposure a little. Let's see if we can get some focus. Yep, you can definitely see laser trimming lines on some of these. Maybe someone want to try to reverse engineer this or draw out the schematic. Maybe that'll give us an idea of what this part uh, actually is. Here's the other laser trimmed part. Uh, pretty similar. Some, uh, looks like it has some exposed sections. Everything else is covered under some sort of uh, like a solder mask. Uh, yeah, not much, pretty, pretty similar, to, similar to the other one. What else have we got? It's not too much else. There's a small die. It's probably an op-amp or something. Uh, another one over here. That's just a cap. Uh, yeah, another, probably an op-amp. And somewhere, let's zoom out a bit. Uh, yeah, it's not all that much else. There's a few uh, what looks like diodes or transistors. But yeah, that's pretty much everything that's on this uh, hybrid chip. So pulling this thing out of the case, we can see it was has a asset tag from David Grant U.S. Air Force Medical Center. I'm curious what they were using that for. This is sort of for like lead paint detection and things like that. I wonder if they had it customized for some sort of medical application. Manufactured by SciTech Corporation. Yeah, let's see what's in this thing. Feels very, very sturdy, very heavy. The uh, casing is made out of uh, injection molded plastic of some sort. There we go. And oh, lead acid battery. I see that's all that's in here is a couple of lead acid batteries. Of course, those are going to be completely dead by this time. How do these come out? They. Oh, you take them out from the back. It doesn't really matter. That. And yeah, there's just the power input, which is like incredibly close. Like, look at the how tight that is. Let me see if I can get some light in there. That is just so tight in there. Huh. There we go. Oh, there's a rubber band tied on. Huh. And there's just a bunch of wires. Yeah, just a bunch of wires going off to that connector. 
There isn't a vast amount in this, let's see if we can get this off. Go. Yeah. So as expected, this is pretty boring. There's just a DC to DC converter. It says 24 volts in and 18 and minus 18 out. This board is just a whole bunch of uh, sort of glue logic and stuff. Is probably something, some sort of I/O transceiver, like a peripheral chip. It's a 65 MS 6516 buzzer, a bunch of random logic. There's some switching power supply. Actually, no, that's going to be the data transmission stuff for the uh, and power transmission stuff to the probe, uh, DC to DC. And that's probably something to do with the LCD or similar. On the front, there's pretty bog standard. Uh, LCD controller, LCD uh, with Sanyo control chips for the matrix LCD. Uh, all hand, you know, these, yeah, a lot of labor went into this. These are uh, these are hand wired, hand soldered into there. What else? This is going to be for another hand soldered connections for the. It's going to be for the membrane key panel. And let's get this off and take a look at this other board that actually has the CPU and probably a bunch of memory on it. A few minor bodges in the back of this, but uh, nothing too bad. Really nice gold-plated connectors there. That would have been expensive. And then on uh, this side, yep, we just have... That must be the CPU program, GV4 MAP3 something N. And then some random peripheral chips, got a 12.48 megahertz oscillator, super cap, one farad, 5.5 volts for some backup. That's probably Dallas, that's probably the RTC chip right there. Don't see the crystal anywhere. Where would the crystal be? Unless that's just battery backed RAM. In fact, yes, there's an EEPROM here, and the rest is probably, all these other chips are probably just... Uh, just RAM and they're storing, it's probably for storing trace data and, and stuff like that. So yeah, overall there's uh, not much in this thing. It's just injection molded housing and a bunch of boards. Yeah, they didn't really expect this to be too interesting. So I hope you found that teardown of the map spectrum analyzer interesting. I was really hoping for an x-ray tube, a miniature x-ray tube in this thing, but no, we weren't so lucky to get that. But I think it was still a very interesting teardown and that uh, hybrid IC was really cool to look at. Anyway, thanks for watching.